So that's oh, what I don't know if I went over that with you because I have a whole physical packet. It's a little oh, bit outdated, maybe, oh, but it's basically a lot of stuff that ends up yeah. kind of scaring them. <laughs> but it's like, do you have all of these disclosures? Do you have all yeah. of this? Do you have all of that? And then you know, you ask them questions like, <laughs> yeah, because you go and what you the what you do is you leave your car running, you run up to the door, you knock. When they answer, you're like, hey, I just was in the neighborhood. I saw your house was for sale. I wanted to drop this off for you. Like, call me if you have any questions. Nine times out of 10, they will call you and you don't even have to call them. But if they don't, call them two days later or the next day after they've had a chance to look over it and just say, hey, you know, I stopped and dropped that packet off. Want to know if you have any questions and just curious. And then, are you scared yet? Yeah. Are you scared? But yeah, like I did the cold call like once. Like, because when I first threw and like selected all the homes on Zillow, I called all of them and like, they didn't really get anywhere. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and get those because what scripts have I given you? Did I give you physical scripts? Um, I don't, I don't really have any scripts actually. So, I don't think so. look through these okay. and just make sure you put them back. But I put them here so that everybody has. Have you looked through these? No, I probably There's should. a lot. There's like, 400 like probably even more um this one is lead generation this one is working with sellers so both of them are really good but there's a whole table of contents and then there's like 500 different ways to attempt to talk to a, a fisbo so find them and then whichever what <laughs> leave your lover <laughs> okay yeah like and it should your 500 ways to, um so and then you can just make copies of whatever you okay. want but Great. I would definitely look at those. I have a question. So um, uh, on the schedule, we're scheduled for Tuesday as well, but um, they said it was like four weeks, so I'm not sure if this is, I don't think I was wondering because our first like, I from my other people or whatever, they usually have their meetings on Tuesdays at like nine or ten or whatever, so I just wanted to make sure because they were like, That's all I got. Yeah, today's the last day. Oh, okay. Once we close, well, I can show you how to spend your money. How about that? Yeah. How to spend our money. Yeah. Because that's all you got left. Or to oh. not spend it. How to save for taxes. Fun stuff. Right. Yeah. House hack. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Oh, I know. Yeah, I'm doing, I'm gonna jump on it because I just realized oh way too big my house is for me. <laughs> so well, I, I'm just like, man, I have so much stuff. Like, do I really want to use every year? But at the same time, it's like, well, I mean, you have an opportunity. Oh, totally. To, who well, lives in your was, house right now, though? You and your husband? So I would have bedrooms you could rent. Do you have a basement? Do you have a basement? Yeah. That's what I was looking into. I could put a kitchenette and two, one or two bedrooms in my basement and a bathroom. We just have so much stuff. So, like, in our basement, I have, like, half of it is, like, a big workout area. Mm -hmm. And then, the like, my husband, since we, so when we lived in Utah, um, we, you know, like the builders there, it's like standard, like four or five car garages. So we had a five car garage in Utah. And so we came here. Wow. They only had <laughs> it's for all those have kids a, they have. A, yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't yeah. They that. have a lot of toys as well. So like they're very outdoorsy. So they have like, you know, side by size boats, you know, all the things. Yeah. So they make the big garages like standard. And so when we came here, my husband has so many like hobbies and like tools from our garage there. So it's so, all in the basement now. Like, now he has a section of that in the basement. And then we used to make like all kinds of like shirts and stickers and like with the cricket. And um, so now we have like that section storage. So there's no other space for people or things, um, you know, in the basement with all those. But that's what I'm saying. Morning brand. So you know? Yeah. I just feel like we can house that. Because oh, what we have is our room stuff that we lived in. Like Jimmy and Brent, can you guys hear me? I can. Yep. Oh, there you are. Like this smaller. Good morning. Yeah. You know, like condos, townhouses. Good morning. Um, you're five minutes late, but I allowed it anyway. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm just kidding. We haven't even started yet. Um, okay. Have fun. I'm gonna go get your children. Thank you. This lady I uh, did an open house for back in the day, she um, had 
her, like instead of her window well, she, and I'm sure this was not cheap. However, she dug, it was like in the side of the house, dug out an entire staircase into the basement. So it wasn't like a walkout basement, but it was now. Cause so it was she like had a well. herself. I don't know. She, I mean, she didn't, she had somebody do it, but she, and then there were stairs going down there and there was like a little side yard area with an outdoor seating. And she had a whole apartment in her basement and she rented it out for like $1,200 a month. Well, our next door, our next door neighbors, their house is like a, a rental. Yeah. And um, they rent it for like $3,500 a month. Oh yeah. So I'm like, yeah, for sure. Our mortgage isn't 3,500 a month, so right, you right know, for it, for sure. Yeah, what's crazy is like, I mean, by UNC, all those really, really old homes. It's very interesting, like how creative people have gotten to make those into multiple apartments. Like, oh yeah, house. yeah. It's so interesting, for sure. There was one person who actually like built like a brick building attached to like my like attached to my neighbor's house, and it had like seven more apartments. That was just very wow. interesting. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, so it was like your usual historic home, and then just like this brick building behind it. Actually, it's more like made of cinder blocks. It looks absolutely terrible. Oh, I bet. But, yeah, exactly. But, yeah. but it functioned, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. All right, so I'm going to be like here and there, and probably in y'all's book, and because there's no video. <laughs> so this is going to be short. Were no. you going to be able to as well um, send over those? I uh, did. Did you get it? I did not get any. Uh, I did get it. I didn't get it. You any. got it. Maybe I just don't have the. Uh, I got it, Gwen. You did. Who is that, Brent? Or? It's Jimmy. Okay, Jimmy. Brent, did you get yours? Did you get it? You're talking about the spreadsheet, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, here, let me just forward to you right now. What's your email? Um, you can send it to J A I M E dot s-m-i-t-h and it, it was only a couple days ago sometimes it takes me a bit but i had it written on my thing and i couldn't throw away that packet until i did what was on it so i was like right why do I have this white box? I got it yesterday at 9.16 a.m. See? Because I knew I was going to be in here, and y'all were going to call me out. <laughs> at 9.16 p.m.? A.m. Oh, oh, no. You won't ever get anything from me that late because yeah. I'm snoozing. Or I've had a beverage, and I should not send anything. I was still asleep. I'm not that. I'm not that point in my life. Like you know, I'll reply to your 10 p.m. text at like 5:30 in the morning. Yes. Oh gosh. Yeah. Oh no. You're welcome. You can do that for me because I'm already up. I talk with Brittany every day at at 6:30, and we used to do it at five, and then that wasn't working so well. Okay, I've just got a white box, and I don't know why. So it'll send in a bit, or yeah, schedule is like I'll figure it out. Like or midnight and wake up at like 10 or 11 a.m. Okay, does everybody have their um, you, you guys? I gave y'all the packet, right? So Dio comes in and then we'll give her one. Um, this is basically what happens after you're under contract and what that looks like. And so, truly, there's a lot of it that has to look the same for everybody, and then there's a ton of it where this is where you get to shine for your client and do different things and maybe you dance this way and somebody else dances that way and you're just gonna um systematize as much as possible i will say uh it's going to be easier which is uh what these blank pages are in here about um doing the timeline and stuff so that you know that you don't miss anything and that is going to be amazing for you if you can systematize it so let me see if i can this is just going to be a page down thing or not. No, I definitely like a list of what has to happen. Yeah. Anything. Oh, I've got to scroll. Okay. So um, this is what we're going to focus on today. Moving on. So building those timelines out is going to be uh, something that's going to be systematized and you'll know you're not going to miss anything when you're talking to your um, 
when you're doing your listing presentation or your buyer consult, this is where you can go, okay, first we're gonna do this and then we're gonna do this and then we're gonna do this. And then when this happens, then we start a different process. For me, I don't spill everything because it's super overwhelming. But then I just say, okay, this is our first stages. And then after that, we're gonna do um, uh, it differently. I mean, we're gonna implement another timeline, but don't worry, that's why I have timelines so we don't miss anything. And most people, um, it saves them from being overwhelmed because they used to like give it all to them and see how much I, I know. And then it, that's what it kind of came across as is look how much I know, but it, it's really overwhelmed them. So it wasn't beneficial. I think I'm gonna bring this down here. So I don't have to get up. Um, and then we'll go through the, the best um, practices for managing your deal, um, your command stuff. I don't know. Talk to your TC. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Are you going to have a TC? No. Oh, a transaction coordinator. Transaction coordinator. Oh, yeah. Somebody, well, somebody will TC. Somebody yeah. will uh, TM. That's what I'm like. Oh, a transaction oh, manager or something? Yeah. It's, so, again, it's huge, but I have uh, yeah. my coach guy said that I'm not allowed to use one for the first four transactions. Four? Four. Yeah. He said uh, the reason why is because if say they move or they go out of business or you know something happens or something like that and I gotta pick it up where the pieces fall apart but I have to know how to do it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's definitely you know good to know but also same thing like so excuse me like everybody says they want to use a TC. Yeah that's I I like it. Crystal what's your reasoning behind it? I think I kind of second what she was saying mm -hmm. I, I have to know it in order to fix it or you know before I can ask somebody else to do it. I'm one yeah. that has to have my hands kind of in everything. Yeah. So, so am I, I'm a super control freak in the little sidebar. Um, super control freak. I did the first one and I thought, oh my gosh, because there's so many stuff, things that are my, um, in price per hour wasn't worth these small menial, menial tasks that have to get done, but do they need to be done by me? So I will say then get with um, somebody who's doing it themselves or a TC maybe even in the office and say, you'll, you'll probably need to pay them. Say, I need, I want to know your system. Show me your email that you send out for this. Show me when you send out this. Show me when you send out that because it's going to benefit you so that you're not running in a circle because otherwise you're going to get a deal and then you're going to be looking for a deal. You're going to get a deal and be looking for a deal because right. there's so much in between. You don't have time to be lead genning because you're sending out one more email or checking on the resolution or, right. you know what I'm saying? So until you go through those, you know, you may see this, don't be alarmed. That could be why, because there's so much in that other, because you really need to be like, boom, we're under contract. You got this, the menial stuff. I'm still doing all the conversating with my client not my transaction coordinator. They're not talking to my clients at all. It's really rare. She'll, and she'll ask me, when do you want this schedule? I'll look at my schedule and go, yeah, I can do it here. Great. Then she sends it to the client and says, hey, how does 10 o'clock on BOA, which is exactly what I said, but she makes it look like they're, they have a choice. Right. And then she sends out a, a, like a, here's who I am. Mm -hmm. And she sends it out to the other agent and all that. It's one of the things that I put on my, in my um, love letter from myself to the other side saying, this is who I am. And this is why this is going to be a smooth transaction. I'm not doing this. I'm a professional realtor. I have, I hired somebody on my team. So I put that in there. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's, and it comes out of, um, each deal. So you're not paying for her. She might write or she might present or do a lot of things for offers that fall through and you're not paying her for those. So, you know, I think that they're invaluable, but I totally get the, I did one. Yeah. I was like, like, I, I need to do it one time. Yeah. And it was like, Oh my God. I, I think like, eventually it's just getting to know yeah. it first. Yeah, no, I, and I get Especially it. Especially like, I totally you know, what if something happens and then you're like, well, how do I get paid? You know? And then you gotta yeah. figure that out. Well, that's yeah. 
I get it. Yeah. I'm so OCD. I know, like, it would just drive me absolutely crazy. So I'm like, eh. yeah, no, that's, I, I just, I couldn't do it. I, I just couldn't. Um, okay, so then um, we're going to recap and how to create your success list, what you should be doing and what you should be doing each day. So um, buyer timeline. So when you're looking at your, when you're doing your uh, buyer consultation, this is where I'm saying it's, this is a great timeline to present to a buyer and much more than this, it's a lot. It's a lot to go through each um, each little detail. First, we're going to do this. Then we're going to do this. Then we're going to ask for this. And then we're going to, it's a lot. So um, working with just your basics, because these are your big places that things can fall out of contract to. So we're going to get under contract. We're going to look at a few homes and we're going to get under contract. And then how far you want to take that with them is up to you. Do you want to set some realistic expe expectations on how long that what that looks like in this market right now um, as well. And have that you seen sad. Have you seen that shift a little bit um, on the buy side? I don't know if you've taken like clients out and stuff like that, just because I've seen stuff like on the MLS that is just sitting since the beginning of July. So I don't know if maybe it's just price wrong or like yes. same thing. You see just prices going down, down. Like they like yeah. already adjusted the prices a few times. Right. So I like the, um, the adage that you can't, underprice a house. Now, if a house I thought in the neighborhood, if, if I comp out a property and looks like most everybody else is going to go under contract around 400, and I think that's where it's going to go, I'm not going to price the house at 300. That's going to be ridiculous. And you're probably not even going to get the listing in, in that kind of scenario because they're going to, what? The guy here yesterday said 425, which you know, some people throw out a number from their rear, not right. having any idea what's happening right now. So just to win the listing. And then they have a conversation about backing it up later, which I don't think is fair. I think that's a bait and switch. That's not how I roll. So, um, but I tell my list, my listing, my sellers, um, we're going to look at this right before we go on the MLS. We're going to look at what the pricing is, but I think that we are probably going to end up in the low fours, maybe you're saying in the upper fours, what without, you know, I think we're gonna end up at 480. So, but then if you're looking at the comps and you're thinking upper four, so upper four to me is 470 <coughs> and up to 490. Um, then I might price just under that, maybe at, the, at that bridge, 450. And, because you're going to get a lot more people coming in the door and you've got, if you get more people coming in the door, you've got more opportunity for somebody falling in love with it. And then offering, you need what two offers and then start playing them against each other. I love three because then you're doing the frog about it, you know, and negotiating a higher offer with one of those. And then when you're done, you're done. When they've done capped out and then the value's not there, their funding's not there, whatever it is, this boom, there's what the buyer is willing to pay because the buyer sets the price. They set the market. So we're just trying to put their house out there so that we get enough buyers coming in to look at it and then evaluate where they are comfortable in purchasing this house. I'm just so saying like, you know, it's, it's the, setting I, expectation, you, you know, change it up now just because there are more homes sitting. It's not as well. So you're this, still seeing that. I, still seeing I do it this way all the time and I do it on solds, not on actives. And so then I'll show them, look, this one, they were trying to pinpoint the market and if the market changed just a smidge, then you're, you're lost. You're chasing the market down. And when you start chasing the market down, you'll end up losing at least 10% had you from when you, uh, you could have priced under and then gone over, you know, because now if I can afford 450, some people go in and th some agents will price at 475 and, but they're okay with taking 450. Oh my gosh, why not just price at 450? Cause you might've gotten 475 because of our inventory situation. I'd rather go the other way. I'd rather say, here's what I would, this is the minimum, because that's what you're saying. 
you're not guaranteeing it'll go over because the buyer sets the price and we don't see our buyer sitting with us right now. So we're looking for them. But if we price it where more, more buyers will come in, then we'll see where they set the value on your home. But if you start chasing the market down, then you, so the market's not doing this. Agents have missed priced. And now the buyers out there are not seeing that value on that particular home. Now they're chasing the market down. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So they overpriced it to begin with after about two weeks, because that's what I feel like. Because after, I mean, July has been, is a time that a lot of people go on vacation. You've got less people looking, I think. Um, agents go on vacation in July because it's traditionally a slower time. I talked to somebody yesterday. He's like, I go in the winter because that's when it's really slow. Well, true, but you know, at Christmas, it depends on your age of your kids. If you have kids, whatever, you don't want to go. And you're not probably going to the beach in December, even in Hawaii, unless you go into Australia, I suppose. But can't do that this year. So, um, you know, that's where I feel like once you start chasing the market down, then you're in trouble. So and I, I was just, price lower. I guess what I was asking is like when you're um, trying to set up your buyer, what to expect. Like right now, is that looking different for you? Mm -hmm. You know, on oh, their the expectations because they are um, like houses are sitting a little bit more than they mm -hmm. were a few weeks ago or whatever. No, I still set up that set that expectation with the buyer that they're going to make more than one offer, more than likely. Um, they're probably going to be competing with another offer, and and then if they don't, like Ricky talked about, um, somebody, I think it's one of his listings. He only got one offer. I called one because I was comping out a house that I'm getting signed up today. And um, I called the agent and I was like, tell me why you went from, I'm gonna say it was like 440. It was on the market for six days. It was priced at 440 and closed at 429. What happened? And it's in my in the neighborhood that, and he's like, yeah, my sellers just got a little nervous because they got one offer that first weekend. And all they knew was what the TV says, flying off the market. So they were like, ah, let's just take it. And he's like, so we took it and it closed. I was like, great. I bet he didn't have any other offers. So that's where it ended up. So you may have hit a weekend, like 4th of July. If, if I had a buyer at 4th of July, I would have taken them out. Because a lot of people go, ah, it's the weekend. Wanna... I would hate to displace this home because they probably want to do their fireworks and whatever. Let's go. Because all those reasons are why some people are going to stay home or they went camping or whatever. So do you want your offer to look different than theirs? You know, because you're the only one out here looking. And they're like, if you've got a favorite fishing hole, do you want to go when there's 10 other people out there fishing it? Or do you want to go when it's rainy, overcast? So, my dad was a fisherman. I'm not because my dad was. Because we would go out when it was rainy. It was overcast and drizzly because that's when the fish are biting and everybody else is at home. So that's that's the way I would present that. Um, while in the, in the first few weeks of August, maybe great because there's a lot of people who are going to stay home. Our kids are getting ready. They're they're trying to figure out school schedules. They're still buying for, you know, wherever they are in that, where they're starting school, they're buying school supplies, they're buying the school clothes, they're all these things. And then they're getting ready and then they're getting in. And that might be a three week window where not as many people are out. It seems like there's a lot of consumer behavior. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. So there like, totally is. I'm really glad I covered that. <laughs> Super yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what it is. And it's different than retail mm -hmm. consumer. But yeah, and it'll be different here than it is in other places. Yeah. In Florida, they don't, it, you would think that here wouldn't be big in January to May, but January to May is our, it's go time. Mm -hmm. People are, that's when they're, yeah, they're, it's after the holidays, they're taking down the tree. Let's do this, we're moving. 
Yeah, and January is ramp up. It's not like January 2nd, everybody's ready, but it's ramp up time. And then by February, March, that's when we're at our peak. But when do you need to be lead generating for that February to March business? Now. Yeah. Well, it's like 90 days. So November, October, November, December will get you your first quarter business. Yeah, it's really interesting. So you can't go, all right, now the holidays are over, I'll start hitting the phones. They already listed with somebody else and you didn't get out there. So it's pretty cool. I would rather be door knocking now in this than in my snow boots. Although people <laughs> do open the door when you knock on the door in snow boots and when you're cold and it's snowy, they open, oh my gosh, are you okay? Cut your little beanie on. I highly oh, recommend yeah. your KW beanie for sure. Yeah, because people know who you are before they even get to the door because they would check the ring doorbell. But you're like got snow all over you, so they feel sorry for you. I don't know. I don't know what that if that's truly what that is, but but building a timeline for your so that you can go over it with your buyer to say, look, we're gonna make some offers, we're gonna get under contract. Once we're under contract, we're gonna be working really closely with your lender. That's primarily from the buyer side. They're going to be working really closely with the lender. They've got to get the rest of their ducks in a row. If they don't have all their documents in, they're going to do that because you've got a date, remember, that says when your application is due. And you'll see contracts where it says NA. And it's not true. Donna's taught us all well that your application isn't complete until there's an address in it. Well, now we went under contract. We can put an address in it and check that box easily as long as all the other documents are in. The other piece that you're working with your lender is your um, um, appraiser. Making sure that appraisal time is a time that he can do. And it was in that um, 36, what, 30, 45, 60 day spreadsheets that I sent out um, that it, it says on there, make sure that this, is, this date is good with your lender. So, and that's pretty much until the very, very end, until the appraiser appraisal comes in, that's probably all that you'll deal with the lender. Um, and then your next big job is the home inspection. So I like to attend my home inspections because I wanna see if that inspector makes everything like a huge deal, I don't hire him again. It, let, me, let me back up. I like to give my buyers three different options and say, use whoever you want to. These are the people that I really have enjoyed working with. And I know that they do a good job at looking through the house. You're not going to catch it all. This is to catch the big stuff um, and hope that there's not little stuff lurking. Um, and then they get to hire them. And then I do my best to go. But it is three to four hours, depending on the size of the property. And you're sitting there. So I asked the buyer then to go and, and come like at the last hour so he can see the panel, what the pan, here's the turnoff valves, here's the, all that kind of stuff. I'm asking my, my inspectors to go over that kind of stuff with them as well as what he found in his findings. So they really don't need to be there all that time. They often like to be there. I just take a computer earbuds and do, do my work and let them walk around. Um, try not to have kids there. You know, we've got ladders up and we've got people on the roof. And if you're trying to wrangle kids, it's just not the right time or place to have the kids there. Do you take any like snacks or anything for your clients if they want to stay? Or if they're like, no, we'll be there. I get there every time. I don't. No? Mm -hmm. You could. I've done that when we were going around with an out of town buyer. I took um, a bunch of snacks and put them all in the back and they were in a, like, they were healthy, unhealthy, everything kind of snacks, but they were out from out of town and I did that. Um, but typically they don't even ride in your car. So I don't, I mean, I figure that they probably thought of that. Um, and I say all that to say that I have three kids. I probably have some snacks in the car. So they may not be what they're looking for, but you know, are they gluten-free? Are they nut-free? Are they whatever? So I just, I just have it. But that's a, that is a good, nice touch though. It's not that you can't, that makes sense. You mentioned car ring. I'm just curious. Um, do you ever have like clients right in your car with you? Cause I know like Ricky was saying like, never. Um, I've had it twice ever. Twice. Okay. Uh -huh. 
and they were both out of town people. One of them came and they were like, we're not going to have a car. And their aunt was, they were staying up in Morrison. The aunt brought them down to the first house. And then we looked at the first house and then they got in my, in my car. And then we drove around all day. So you're having lunch with them, everything. So I'm an introvert. This doesn't look like I'm an introvert, but I'm an outgoing introvert. So that means that when I go home, I'm like, please don't talk to me. My kids are like, please don't touch me. And it's just like, I need some space to re go. Um, where a true extrovert's like, this was amazing. And then they get more jazz. By the end of those days, I'm just, uh, so I, I love to have my car because then I can have those. I can be at my best at the house where you're on the whole entire time, which for an introvert is really difficult to, there's no time to recharge. Um, but yeah, it's really rare. And if they want to, I'm ready because I keep my car relatively clean, you know, but I picked up the last one was a Castle Pines. Her uh, sister lived up in the village. So, and I were here rolled up in the mama mobile. I'm like, my car's an 07 Honda Odyssey. My first job is to be mom, you know, the, and I make a joke of it, but without being, you know, disrespectful to my car, because it is, you know, I'm like, thank you for still working. You know, it's like, I don't want to buy another car. So I, but, and that, and, and all that to say that the next car will be a little bit fancier probably so that I can feel more comfortable if I need to, but it's never, it never happens. But I know plenty of people who are like, oh crap, I got to put somebody in my car because their desk is right here in this. <laughs> so my 13 year old is finally heavy enough to sit in the front seat. Can I sit in the front seat now? <sighs> yeah, I guess so, but you got to move my stuff, you know, so. But I, it's really rare that I, I've only taken somebody in my car twice. Yeah. That's kind of good to know. Because I guess like going into real estate initially, I was just like, gonna have to show people around and like show them. And yeah. I'm like, glad That's that, the way like, it used to be. I'm glad that it's not really like a standard now. To mm -hmm. have to do that, well, so. and I think too, if somebody says, well, do we ride with you or do we, well, it's up to you. I can take you around. But I also want you to feel comfortable in discussing each and every property. So, oh, and let me back up. There's one other time that I, I rode with my clients and then we would talk about the properties too. But um, I had, it was a time, okay, talk about nobody being out. There was seven inches of snow out and he's like, How, how's your van? I was like, ooh, no, <laughs> I'm riding with you. But it was a friend of ours. So I could easily do that. And when you're working with people that you already know, it's easier to put them in your car and they know uh, there's a French yeah. fry on the, yeah, that was Susie, you know, whatever can kind of make fun of it and roll on. I brought you snacks. Are you kidding? You know, <laughs> make fun of it and go. Um, is that, that, did that answer that? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so then once we'll talk more about what the home inspection might look like, I think it goes in here. And if it doesn't, we'll dig in because I think it's really important. Um, your home insurance, you're not involved in that. That's a transaction coordinator thing that they send it over and say, hey, don't forget it. this date's coming up. And it explains in the email what that looks like. Um, but they just need to get insurance. It comes to, it. Um, I won't say it's a problem, but it's, it's a thing when you're looking at a condo where you've got the insurance maybe can't, they can't carry the insurance that they always or they usually carry. And so they have to go outside and they're trying to find somebody who can cover that particular property in that condo unit so you want them on that with a condo quick most single family homes I've not seen that anybody had any problem getting insurance somewhere you know with your typical all state USAA state farms whatever um, and a home warranty some people do them some people don't and then your clothes and then in here too it talks about your closing gift um, so what I've been doing for my buyers, because we're, we're coming in hot. We're like, I don't care. Oh, it's got sewer issues. I don't care. Let's just roll. And I'm like, no, no, no. So I've been buying a home warranty and say, this is, I have to, you have to make it super, super, super clear because sitting at the closing table feels awkward then because you don't have anything. So they're like, remember I gave you the home warranty, $515. You can't even write all that off. 
So you, I mean, you really have, you can write off, it's 25 or $50 is all you can write off, which is ridiculous because they look at what, you give them a gift card and they look at your, because they see your commission on the closing statement. What? A gift card to Chili's? That's all I got. You know what I mean? It's like, so make sure it feels, anyway, that's why I did the home warranty because they have probably skipped over some stuff that they're going to need to look into later. Um, that's, you can't fix things that are broken, but things that break on their own. So I feel like that's a good, it kind of gives them a little bit of peace of mind knowing that they passed over some things that they really would have loved for the seller to fix. But in order to get into properties these days, you really don't ask them to fix much except for big items like roof or a sewer or, you know, uh, other things might cause you to walk away. So that's where I put in the home warranty, but it's not required and it almost makes it look like it's a required thing. It's not. Okay, your seller. Um, look how, okay, look. One, two, three, four. Uh, let's have six items over here. And and this, execute a contract. This should have even more tick marks to the left because it's a long time before you get here, potentially. Um, but still, there's a lot more work in a buyer. That's why they say listings to last. To last in the business, you want listings. So you're go <laughs> the timeline that I would like to see um, what I present to my sellers is okay here's when we're going to put it on the we're backing it up when do you want to be out what do, do you need a post-close occupancy do you need here's when we need to be under contract by and this is when we're looking to close to get you there maybe if we have a post-close occupancy you don't need to use it all so this timeline's still okay are you okay if it closes a week earlier do you really really need that because if you do then that backs up this part you know, all those things you're asking to make sure that you've got their end time, the end in mind, and you're just backing it up backwards. So then they say, you know what, I sometimes you walk in and they say, I want it on the market this weekend. Okay, hold on, because I need a little time to market you so that we know that people know about it. Why this weekend and why not the following weekend? Because I feel like a good 10 days is what I prefer because I like the sign in the yard, the pictures. Pictures might take a day and a day and a half, 24 hour period or something. Um, and then coming soon, I like to utilize that and then go active. And so I explain all this. If we wanna be active here, then let's back up to do coming soon. I do active on a Thursday so that we can start showing on Friday. Then I want the, I want coming soon by Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, depending on what time frame I have so that people can start to see it but they know they got to book their appointment on Thursday for the weekend. So it's just a, it's a ramp up. And then, so if I've got it coming soon on Monday, I have pictures then. So that means I had to have pictures by Friday the previous week. I'll put a sign in the yard three days before because I can, right? So I put a sign in the yard. Now you get some drive-by traffic. It's not in the MLS, it's not on Zillow. So what do they do? Hey, I saw this house. I really want to see it. Well, what just happened? Got your information. And now you can have a conversation if they already have an agent. If they do have an agent, get the agent's name. Find out for sure if that's what they're looking for. Because you can tell the agent more than you can tell that guy because it's not actually on the market yet. All that, before you talk to an agent about that house, you better have that your signed listing agreement. Don't learn that lesson that way because they could call, they're not going to call them. They're like, oh my gosh, when is blah, blah, blah. And you inadvertently say, I'm getting paperwork signed today. An unethical realtor could run down there and get the deal from you. So you want to make sure before you start spreading the word, make sure it's yours. Okay, make sure you're going to get paid. Um, and I don't say that because uh, it's just a thing I have. Like, oh, I'm so scared somebody's going to snake a deal for me. Hi. So, um, so that's how I like to do it. I like to have the sign in the yard, then do photos coming soon and then active and then showings. And hopefully you don't have to go through two weekends. You might, you know, if, 
I do you open houses on yours now? I haven't since um, I did an open house March 2020. It's the last one I've done. And it was the weekend before, lockdown. Mm -hmm, before we shut down. And I had a contract on Monday. So, and I think, I was like, oh, thank God. And they were moving out of town. And she said so many times, I still, you know, message her and stuff and Facebook her. Oh my gosh, I just keep thinking about the, the timing of everything. And I'm like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. It was big, big. I mean, because one week would have changed everything. I mean, we saw so many people just like, pulling off the market because they didn't know what, I mean, at that time, we didn't even know what this was, you know, are we all going to die? Is 80% of the population going to be dead? You know, do I need to sell? Do I need to put myself through the stress? You know what I mean? We had no idea. So that was, uh, it was good. So then you've got your timeline, hopefully is going to produce you an offer that you're going to be willing to accept. Now, at your inspection time, um, your sellers need to be clear that they're not to be there. So most of the time, the sellers are that I've had going, wait, what? I mean, they know they're not going to be there because they've done their own inspection. But at the same time, they're, are you going to be there? No, you're not either. Look at all this time that you freed up. Remember that other guy? They're in there making sure that nobody's walking out with the TV because your inspector isn't licensed. So he's not, I make sure I mark on my listing contract that it's only licensed agents and licensed appraisals that are coming in without somebody else licensed who's accompanying them. I don't wanna to go to the appraisal, although I do, um, but not in the same way that I'm not staying. Um, so I'm protecting their, somebody else's insurance is covering that listing. Does that make sense? Crystal's like, I don't mm -hmm. know if it does or not. No, it does. Um, so for your inspection, you don't have to be there, but the other agent, you make sure that they are aware that you want them there, that that's what you're listing. If that's what you've agreed to with your seller, that you're asking that other agent to be there because it, sometimes they decide not to come. And now you've got a buyer in your seller's house that, and nobody's licensed. Because I may give the code to the inspector and then knowing that the agent is going, you know, in there as well. And it's, he may get there first and you know, yeah, that's fine. Especially if it's somebody that's a big company. If it's, you know, there's a guy that's up in my neighborhood. It's a really great inspector. He's just, his, it's just him, you know, but if it's a pillar to post, you can go in before, but I want the agent there also. Um, okay, so then the appraisal, I go with a stack of papers. This, I'm on the sell side. I'm meeting that appraiser. I will even let them in if I can because I want to meet them. So I will on purpose not give them a lockbox code. Because so what I do is I take a manila envelope. I'm looking for one here. I take a manila envelope and on the outside of it, it looks like I use it at my house. It says the address up here. It says um, three two, uh, the, maybe so, Smoky Hill subdivision. It says um, all the great things about it. I've written it on the outside of my note of my Manila. This is not the time to get a fancy because you want to write all over it. It looks like it's your. You're using this, and now you're handing it all over. So all of this, and then I say on, um, I say list how many offers, um, and then I write in red, bigger, like all this will be my regular handwriting, um, and then it'll be bigger in red, under contract for like whatever, we listed it for 400, under contract at 450. And then um, close date, and I write all that, not because he doesn't have it, because inside is gonna have the winning offer, um, and I don't redact that because he's working for them. But then I'll redact the ones if I've got multiple offers, I'll redact the highest ones and put those in there as well. So now he has a stack of that and then he has some comps. And then appraisers will go a, a mile out. And so I'll pick some that support this number and put them in there. And then from on that 
this was a contract I write in red, um, the offer across it, you know, 480, whatever it was. The reason I do all that is because your subconscious mind does not know. It guides you without knowing it's guiding you. And it, you, your conscious mind can't do anything about that subconscious mind doing that. So I'm showing that appraiser what number I want, 450, without saying, okay, it's going to appraise at 450, right? You know? And then one time my neighbor had, um, was doing a reverse mortgage and I helped her do both of her reverse mortgages. And she's like, I'm really hoping it comes in at 480. I'm really hoping it's, I said, here's what I want you to do when you open the door to the appraiser. Cause she was there cause it's a refi. And I said, oh yeah, I, I just see a lot of houses just like mine and they go for 480. You just say 480 as many times as you can. Even if it's, you know, the, the music channels on channel 480. It doesn't matter. They're going to hear 480 more than they've ever heard 480. And both times her appraisal came in on the money because I don't care if it comes in over. I mean, on the sell side, on the buy side, they're happy. But even if there's um, a, an appraisal gap, I still do that because I hate the time that we're in right now with these appraisal gaps. I feel like we're putting buyers at a disservice is not the right word, but it's the cleanest word I can come up with. Nobody wants to feel like they're overpaid by a, yes. an appraisal gap. Like, oh, great. By a ten lot. Grand more. Just to get into a more. house. Yeah. Well, if they did 10, you know, it's a lot of times it's 50. It's yeah. part of it. That's the money they I've would seen, have put onto the, into right, the down payment. Recently, I seen someone that did it. Um, there was a six hundred. dollars thousand dollar home and they put a hundred thousand dollars over in a full appraisal gap. Yeah. I mean it was seven hundred thousand right right in, you know. Yeah. And I don't know how much it came out, but I was just like, that's just ridiculous. You know, it's just like people are willing to spend all this money just so they can get a house, you mm -hmm. know. And I just think that's absurd. Like yeah. Well, well I, then I have a question though. Yeah. That. So I mean is it like Usually what comes down to the agent for just not listing it quite high enough is why there's just such a large appraisal. Gap. Sometimes. So I was going to just about to say that. Okay. Remember, I said I, I price a little under. So what if I priced at 400, knowing it'll go for 20 for, tw yeah, for 25 over, it ends up going for 50 over and then it appraises at 425. They only have to cover that. And part of it was me pricing it a little under. But you also don't want to price it on so far under that it's ridiculous. You know, I wouldn't price a 300. I wouldn't put it at 300. You're not going to get the same people. Yeah, They're like, not it even looking right at it. to like, you know, list it when it could have praised for so much more. Like, well, and it like, could, but it's subjective. What if it doesn't? Mm -hmm. It's so subjective. Pricing is even subjective mm -hmm. to a point. There's your, your, um, you know, a bedroom is going to be 5,000 plus or minus, uh, you know, because that's how appraisals do it. Uh, an extra car garage is going to be about 5,000. You can make those kind of adjustments and stuff and knowing that that, but when they go in and they go, oh my gosh, I love this. Let's say it's a kitchen and they have floor to see or floor to ceiling, floor to ceiling cabinets. They have this cabinets that go all the way up to the top. Well, that appraiser loves that they're going to weigh it a little bit more because remember that subconscious mind, you can't, you can't undo it. It's in there. Um, so they love that. So they're going to give it a little bit more weight. This same appraisal company comes in different appraiser. They don't like those. They wish that those were glass and had the backlit or something. And they like to put their tchotchkes up there. That's how they grew up or whatever they're going to undervalue that a little bit. I mean, it's not going to be a lot. It's not like thousands of dollars, but those little things add up. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a kid who always peed on the floor with an oval toilet. And this house all has round. Yay. Oh, round isn't even popular anymore. You know, who has a round toilet anymore? The people who haven't upgraded their bathrooms. Um, you know what I mean? So it, it is somewhat subjective. 
those things that don't have a like a dollar amount on them mm -hmm. where square footage and finished basements and that kind of stuff do so i don't know it almost seems like the appraisal should just be kind of like kicked out <laughs> yeah right <laughs> but then everybody would be over yeah. over then the lender would be like yeah. well how much should i lend on this yeah property? Uh -huh. like, they need to have some sort of expert to go and yeah. say if they were, if they were all doing yes. no recourse loans that would be amazing but then that would be an S show too. Mm -hmm. so interesting. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know, I mean like uh, Angela Thompson who was productivity coach is the one who taught me about the, oh no, I take that back. It was actually my first broker um, taught me about that. And then Angela was like, yes, that makes so much sense. Cause we just know that mindset piece of it. Brittany and I have talked about it too. And it's just, uh, does Ricky do that? No, Ricky goes out and gets all the comps and gets the contract, does all that stuff, except for writing all that crap on the outside. He still gives a packet. So does Ryan. Most everybody does the packet. I just write all this subliminal stuff on the outside of it. The sub, I'm writing, I'm, I'm talking to the subconscious mind when I write all that stuff on the outside and how I write it, how, what color I write it in, how many offers. I'm letting them know this is all pertinent information I would have put in an email, but it's so much more powerful when you can make it big, and it's in handwriting and you hand it to them. And so if I don't, one time I had 40 offers on a house in Aurora um, and it was in December. Yeah, it was December of 2020. And I met the appraiser out there and um, well, he was on his way. And then I called him because I'm like, because your buyers aren't, your sellers aren't here for the appraisal either. So those two times that they got to be out that three times all the showings, however many that is, and then the inspection and the appraisal. And so uh, I was, I called him and said, um, give me an ETA. And he's like, oh, I'm still 45 minutes out. I'm like, okay, I'm going to put it on the bench right here. Got, I just want to be helpful because a lot of old crusties, they just, especially if you look younger, um, don't like it. How are you to be telling me how to appraise this house? No, no, no. I know you've got all this information too. Um, I just wanted to be helpful. So this is what I've compiled. And I've also, because we got multiple offers, I put some of those in there. Oh my gosh, that's so great. Or, all right, thanks. And they're just, they don't care. So if I'm talking, remember the subconscious mind is something they don't need, they can't block it even. So now I'm talking to that. That's beneficial to me. Like, like you're saying too, um, when you're doing something that's subliminal like that in writing, it can also help out because it's different. It's like when you see a something um, like a paper, right? And it's like all printed, um, you don't really pay much attention. But when you see something in handwriting, you're like, oh, like just mm -hmm. automatically, like, yeah. just to say, like, and it's in different colors. And yeah. I'll do highlighters on the contracts inside. And, yeah. yeah. And I'll point out the differences. Like if there's, if I've printed out the MLS sheet, um, and it says, and I'll put the agent, you know, how you can print it for the client without the agent information on the bottom, or you can print it for yourself. I can't remember what it's called. Um, and it'll have agent information on it. I'll print it with the agent information so they can easily call the other agent and go, was there anything bizarre about this? Nope. It was all straightforward. Great. Thanks. And it just gives them, they just feel better about working with me. Um, and not because they're going to do anything different, but or maybe not, you know, or maybe so they will. You have multiple offers. How many of like the top offers do you put into your little packet? Not very many. I write on the outside of the thing that says that we got, like on that one, we got 40 offers. I put the ones that, that indicated the largest dollar amounts, probably three. Three, okay. Yeah, and then the winning. You know, if, if you didn't get that many, then I might not even talk about it because I don't want to point out that we didn't, this is my only offer. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to put that in there either. So yeah, it's just kind of experiment. What's going to work for you? What does this feel like for you? Yeah, but it's worked for me. We haven't um, so if you did been only under get one, ever. If you ever did, if you didn't only get one and then there was like, say a house down the street that was the same one that sold for X amount, you know, then do you put like, oh, so such and such sold for this much? I put it in the MLS sheet. I print the MLS sheet and put it in there. And if it hasn't closed yet, I print out the sheet that has that agent information on it. And I'll call the agent myself 
and say, hey, we're doing an appraisal soon. Your house and my house comped out the same. You priced yours here. I priced mine here. Did you go over? Because really they shouldn't tell me what it went. Because if it falls out, especially if it's after mine. Right. So I'm at appraisal stage. They may be at inspection. They could fall out. They don't want that number out there. Um, and that's how I think of it. Now they can tell an appraiser because they're not going, they don't have clients that could come in and grab that deal for only this when it could go next time for more. Probably not, but so they may be willing to tell that the appraiser how much it went for exactly. And they wouldn't an agent. But yeah, I put it in there, even if I only had one, all the comps and all the contracts, not all the contracts, all the bigger contracts, three or four of the bigger, because you're going to have the ones that are, when I've gotten those 40 offers, I had five that were good offers. And I had the other 15 were just poop and less than poop. It's just something to say. I mean, really, I had five legit offers and a bunch of crap. And do, you, do I want 40 offers ever again? No, I had to present every single one of them. And they were on that spreadsheet and no, it's not, that's not what you want. You're not going after the most offers because they're not going to be, there's gonna be a defining line between these are the cream, these are the not. Yeah, does that make sense? All right, and then closing. Um, I like to go to my closings in 2020. It wasn't really a thing. I still went, even if I stood in the parking lot and waited for them. Cause I feel like as my job is not done until they're in the, somewhat in their house, Yeah, until, you know, until it's closed. So now with the seller, um, what kind of a closing gift do you give them? What do you want? No, I do. Um, it depends on who they are and it depends on. I'll, I hate to say it, but it depends on the price. Mm -hmm. um, I did, I hired somebody to do a closing basket for me and they needed like three weeks. And they spent, this family had a nine kids and she went all out and it was like $300. Wow. Yeah, it was amazing. But she, she's like, okay, what is each, you know, each kid like? Or do they have pets? Do they have, and there are companies out there that will do this for you. Um, I'm thinking of, of one, I'll, maybe it'll come to me, um, that I'll ask her, Irene Schick, uh, Schick, Irene Schick, um, she uses a company, it's like client something, client giant, giant something, giant closing, Google it, <laughs> I'll find out. But it's, uh, she uses them and she just does the same, you know, thing for everybody. That's what Ryan Davis does. He has um, a 31 tote that he's got with his, but you, he can do his logo easily in 31 where 31 doesn't do a logo. So you could have something embroidered or something like that with your logo. Um, and he just puts the same stuff in it every single time. It's the same thing. And because the sellers are moving, remember? So maybe it's a pizza card and it's paper towels, it's toilet paper because you packed it and now somebody's got to go, you know, and same thing for buyer stuff. So it just kind of really depends on, I do mine case by case basis. I don't, except for the warranty. I do the warranty every time, but especially this year. And it's worked out well because when you get that, oh my gosh, this is the worst feeling for me. I don't want to put this on y'all, but when you get that call 10 days later, it's typically when it happens, 10 days, two weeks, well, we hear running water in the walls. And when you can go, oh my gosh, have you called 210 yet? It feels much better. It still hurts. I feel like it's not your fault, you know, but especially that the warranty company? that's the warranty company that I use is 210. And Karen comes in here usually. I'm sure she'll be, when we get back to in-person team meetings, you'll see her. So, and I would suggest you come in to the team meetings. They're a lot more fun. And food will be back. So you get to eat. Anyway. 
So, but yeah, they're pretty much on a case by case basis, what I put in there. Okay, so um, you have an activity. Plot communication points. So um, I would say this is on probably page three to build your timeline and when you're going to plot documents on your timeline. Yep, so that's really what that is all about is on page three and four, building out your timeline. Um, so I'm gonna let y'all do that unless you wanna, I mean like not right now, unless you wanna do it right now. But it's 10, does anybody need a potty break? Potty potty, moving on, okay. Is that okay with y'all? Yeah. Boys. And are there, there like no timelines available online that are like all nice and pretty that we can you know, just keep reference and maybe even hang out? Yeah, more or less. Cause you're gonna tweak your timeline. Right. Um, and then your buyer timeline is really in the contract because you're putting it in the contract what you're going to do when you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And then personal preference to when you want to get your pictures done and when you want to get, you have to, so if you think about, all right, I got to go active on the MLS. Well, your, your buyer, your, which way we're going to do buyer. Let's do seller first. So your seller, you got you've got your pictures, you've got all the things that have to happen before you can go on the market, right? Mm -hmm. We think about those. Well, for me, I just I'll start doing the MLS input first, which is unnerving, by the way. It's still unnerving to me. So when it's like, oh my God, I'm about to hit go. And if it's wrong, then this is the price I gotta pay the other agent or whatever. Have somebody look at it. You know, you've got your guy down, you're in the Castle Pines office, mm -hmm. right? Um you got him, they'll look over it for you, but you don't get to do coming. I learned this the hard way. When you hit coming soon and you could change it if you wanted to, but when you change it, it doesn't continue in coming soon. It's like, oh, can't, can't back paddle that up. You probably can if you call Ari Colorado, but I didn't. I just called my client and go, oh, sorry, we just went active. And eh. it's really about days on market for me and my stats. So it really messed me up that time. But um, so you just have somebody else look over your shoulder because they can't access it without being in your MLS if you haven't done it, you know, several times. But even still, I'm like, did I get it all? Did, but the big things for me is what you're going to pay that agent because once they see it, they're, they can screenshot it and that's what you're paying up. So if you accidentally put in 6% everywhere, then I hope you're planning on walking away without any pay because you're paying that 6%. You know, you don't want to make that mistake. I'd rather save you from that, all those things, stupid tax. But yeah, those are hard. So just have somebody else look at it. Most everything else is changeable. You know, if you thought there was no HOA, but you found out there was, you can change that with no problem. It's not a big deal. Or even I've been all the way through to, to getting title work and title says, hey, I found an HOA. You did? Hang on. And then I call my seller and they go, oh, it's voluntary. We never did it. So we just don't think we have an HOA. Okay. Well, now I have to put in that it's a voluntary HOA and who it is and blah, 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 blah. Call the other agent and say, because at that time, now we're under contract, call them to say, hey, by the way, we have an HOA. It's voluntary. My clients don't do it. So we didn't even think about it. I'll do an amend just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Great. Because you can change tons of stuff, even after contract. Yep. But big things that you don't want to have to go down the road is what you're paying the other agent because they don't like that. Yeah, even though they might know, yeah, I should let you do this. It's still going to be, it's going to feel horrible. Maybe they didn't take the ethics class. Well, or you're the one who listed in the MLS that way. You know, so well, it's just, yeah, everybody should be, but still going to feel really sucky for sure. All right. Okay. So if we go to um, best practices on page five, that's probably um, where we need to be. Okay. So what about y'all? Let me have y'all talk for a bit. Um, where do you think, where's the deal at risk of falling apart? What do you think? Inspection. 
Yeah, I'm going to say inspection and appraisal. Those are big, for sure. Um, <laughs> my biggest one right now is um, loan. Is what? Loan. Okay, yeah. Who said title? Any other place? Hmm? Any other place? Um, the earnest money? Not, not put, submitting it? Yeah. Yeah, I'd be thankful for that. Thank you for showing me who you are about. <laughs> yeah, because you can get back on the market fast. Mm -hmm. And I'm not in a big hurry to go to flip it. No, I but know, it's like the sooner you do it, the better. But it's just like you know, sometimes there's other things that's going on. You know, there's different scenarios, and if it doesn't go through, it just falls apart. I, I would say even like say if a family crisis happens suddenly or someone mm -hmm. gets in an accident. Yeah. So like just unplanned tragic incidents maybe. Yeah. 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 And are those covered? Or like, or for instance, COVID. And then they lose their job. <laughs> COVID, yeah. Wh which would then, what would that be under? Where are you going to get your client out? If you're on the buy side, where are you going to get your client out if it's COVID? And they lost their job. Loan objection. Mm -hmm. And you can do that anytime. Please don't wait till the end. If they lost their job and they're not going to be able to pull it together, you've got to remember, you're going to be on the listing side one day and somebody's going to do it to you. So karma is your friend. We want to keep her friendly. Yep. We don't want to make karma a Karen because she'll come after you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Karen karma. Yeah, that's bad news. So, the, yeah, those are all the really, it can fall apart anywhere you've got a date. But those are the major places that you have dates, right? In the loan, in the title, uh, survey, which is title, appraisal, your um, inspection. And earnest money those are all places that you have dates so your job is to make sure that you know if your client needs to get out of their contract where they can get out while still uh getting their earnest money back so a family tragedy you're going to look at that contract and say what do we still have because the dates that have already gone past you have no you can't use those anymore so where can you get like your kids in the hospital? Well, what's, I would have a conversation and, but if they're looking to get out, then you're having a conversation with the, with the lender. Where can we get out with your broker? The last person you're going to have a conversation with is the listing agent. You don't want to make them nervous and they're don't need to be nervous yet. You know what I mean? Don't cause people undue stress. I am like, I'm like a window pane. I am so transparent. All of this is happening. This is happening. This is happening. And then, I, oh my gosh, I have scars from how that bit me in the butt. You don't do that. It's just not, I have a, I have a really great friend who is with Keller, moved over to another office and she's calling me a lot because she's got her first listing. Well, what about this? What about, I'm like, hold up, don't tell them that. Why? I'm just being transparent. I'm like, it's none of their business yet. When it is, you want to be completely transparent, but make sure that well, you- something you don't want to tell them like that? If they're not sure their loan is going to go through, that other agent is on the call, on the phone with a whole bunch of other people. And every time they call somebody else, it further solidifies their uncertainty with the current buyer. Now this buyer needs, everything's fine, everything's fixed. And now they need something. Remember this agent's now very uncertain. They're not sure they're gonna do that. Whatever, I, I can't think of a scenario that because now I'm very tight-lipped. Until I need to say something, I don't. Because I represent, it is not my job to make that seller feel comfortable about this. My job is with my client. And then we are looking at every single way that we can possibly get this deal done. Cause I want to get this deal done. They want to get this deal done. So how can we get it done? And we're pulling in the lender. We're pulling in whoever we need to pull in. And when we're like, okay, we have got to tell the agent now, it's just now we're getting in that line where it's more ethical to tell the agent, here's what's going on. Here's what I've got. I had, I had these buyers 
that made an offer. They gave a huge post close occupancy agreement on the buy side. So the listing people are still in their house. They had a house to close on and her mom passed. So these, they were going to be able to get out early, the sellers, and we're going to give my buyer opportunity to get in early. I did not tell my buyers this because it wasn't certain. Mm. It wasn't for sure. And it certainly wasn't in writing. So until it is, it's a possibility. And then her mom passed away. And now she is the executor of the estate and she's not here. They weren't even in state for when they closed on their purchase. My buyers are over here freaking out because they think it's unfair that these people are living in their house. Don't, you Don't even get me started. Well, either way, if they're past their time, they get charged rate. It wasn't past their time. Okay. This is the offer they made to these people. These people took the cards out. They, this was your offer. Why are you mad? They accepted your offer. 22 offers. Mm -hmm. Really? Now you're mad that these people are living in your house. These people accepted your offer. And the appraiser came in at like $40,000 more. I'm like, oh, and don't forget, you have $40,000 equity. It was like babysitting over here. So it wasn't like it was. So it, but this wasn't their business about the mom passing away and all that kind of stuff. I know this from the listing agent. It's none of this, my client's concern. This is what they asked for. This is what they agreed to. And that's what we're moving forward with. There was no change in the contract. They ended up getting like four days early. They could have gotten a lot more, but they, these these people, this lady actually Facebook those people while they were at the funeral. I'm like, you know that repeat business stuff. Choose who you work with the wisely. <laughs> yeah, it was so that's what I mean by transparency. You don't necessarily need to tell what you know from over here to over here. It will cause more drama. Mm -hmm. And then unfortunately, when she found out that that's what she had done, she didn't care. I was like, oh, yeah, just, yeah. So um, you want to, and the next question is, what are the best practices to keep the deal alive? And I think a lot of it is transparent where you need, need to be, have to be, and the, the, um, the ability to wage where you should be and the where you should not be and can't be. So you've got can't be, should be, could be, have to be transparent and knowing the difference. So you don't want to make somebody nervous when they don't, don't need to be nervous. Um, inspection. What, what would you say was the best, what are best practices around them keeping inspection part alive. Earnest money, I would say if your client isn't delivering earnest money, you're having a hard conversation with them because now, depending on what you've done to get there, you're having that hard conversation. Are you serious with this or not? Do you have a problem getting there? Did your car break down? This is important. You no longer have a contract if your earnest money doesn't get in. There is no the next day. We need to do an amend and extend if you had to be out of town wire it, whatever it is, where is your money? It's a hard conversation. Oh, I got it from my 401k and it's coming. They told me it was going to be here today. Is it? I don't know. It's not here yet. Then we need to do an amend or your deal is dead. Will it be here for sure? Call them, find out. Those are the things that you have to do early. Where's your earnest money coming from? You're writing a check. You're writing a personal check. Do you want me to come pick it up? Do you want to deliver it for you? Are you working? All those things. So wouldn't that be a conversation that you have with them before you even put a contract together or like even probably work with them be like, hey, this is, you're going to have to expect to pay earnest money. Yep. Sometimes that might be this amount to this amount. People ask asking crazy amounts of earnest money nowadays. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you got to be able to come up with that, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah, do you yeah. have it? Can you do it? Yeah. Is it part of your downtime? It doesn't come out of your, your sale if that's a contingency. It has to be yeah. available now. Yeah, right, exactly. Yes, you have that conversation, but I'm talking about after you're under contract and you're going that you don't have a receipt from title yet. So that comes in through email. That you typically communicate with a transaction coordinator or agent and just saying, we don't have it yet. They, that's a date that you are on like a hawk. All dates, you're on like a hawk. Um, and then you're having that kind of hard conversation about where is it going? Because they're so, if they've made many offers that now they think, okay, now what's next? Well, what's next is your earnest money. What are you doing? We had a conversation a day ago. What are you doing? This is important. Oh, I thought I had like, yeah, you will... It's like they're toddlers. You have a conversation over and over and over and over about the same things. It is. It, it, and to be fair, it's a lot of information. It's like a fire hose, you know. So they're forgetting some of it as they go. Um, but the inspection, what are best practices around inspection to keep the deal going? An inspector that doesn't um, make them feel like Certain things are a big deal. That's huge. That's a huge one for me. When you walk around and the inspector says, oh, well, this door jam, you know, it doesn't shut right. And look, when you hold it, when it's hanging here, it wants to come open. That could be a structural thing. <laughs> Note to self, never hiring you again. <laughs> You're not a structural engineer. And now you've planted something. Remember that subconscious thing? Yeah. Now every single door, now if all doors did it, I say it while we're looking at it. Th those are benefits of looking through a lot of houses. Just like, oh, this top screw just needs to be tightened and it'll come right up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or we're in a basement and there's a there's a, a bathroom right here. And look, the fan won't come on. This is a swelling. It needs to be shimmed and, and shaved. And now you're good. That's happening in my basement right now because we moved our daughter down there and she's using, she loves a shower. 45 minutes. That fan is like, oh, I'm sucking as much as I can. Yeah. So all my doors are swole. That's funny. That's me. Yeah. Yeah. She loves a shower. When her hair is way down here too. So you've got long hair. It takes yeah. a lot to lather it. It takes a lot to rinse it. And then yeah. it's got to see a lot to fill up the thing. Yeah. The thing so right. So um, what else would it be in inspection? Think about before you even started going out or maybe in the house as you're showing the house that you're going to offer off. I show them what they may not see because they might have, they have their buyer glasses on. So when I show houses and I'm looking for any like material defects or anything like that, structural uh, gutters, anything like really mm -hmm. like if it looks damaged, I'll point it out. If I feel, even if I'm wearing high heels, <laughs> I'm like walking around in the basement or, you know, anywhere around the house. And if I felt like any bumps, I'm like, like slope, anything like that, mm -hmm. I'm just like, hey, just want to let you guys know I'm not a professional inspector or anything like that. But this is, I mean, this doesn't feel right. So, yeah. Um, or if there's like cracks in the walls or even in the, in the basement, you'll see them like either like that or down yeah <laughs> so yeah um also like um also like in the walls or on top too um there's been some that i've seen that are so bad like there's like this huge gap in the houses i don't know what it is but i mean I, I oh get like it. the as so a joint is we yeah. the settle more yeah like so like the houses that house house move yeah like the houses move because i mean well, the bent oh, clay yeah. and stuff. So, yeah. I mean, anything like that, you know, because like you said, they're just, you know, looking, oh, it looks so pretty, but they don't actually notice the cracks or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And as an agent, well, we need to look out for the best interest too. Yeah. Yeah. So at least they know what they're getting into. Like, yes. if they can fix it, if not, you know, because some people are not that handy, um, but at least they know about it rather yeah. than, oh, we missed it. You know, like, no. See. Yeah, I find it. And especially too, like right? if there's FHA too, like FHA loans, um, because there, there's peeling paint, anything like that, and that's that's gonna be an issue yeah. um during appraisal. So if the seller's not willing to fix it, then we go again back to the same thing. 
And they shouldn't have marked yeah. FHA if they weren't willing yeah. to fix it. Yeah. So, yeah. so I would have backing that up if for FHA, if there's peeling paint, I've got the house in Aurora that's coming on and the exterior is peeling and it's got some of that um, like metal flashing. So there's siding down, metal flashing and then brick on the bottom and all that's peeling because you can't, why do they paint the metal flashing? It's like painting gutters. It comes off, just get the plastic ones that match. Um, but so if you're walking through that and you see all that, then I'm calling the listing agent and going, you marked FHA, I'm assuming then that you want to paint the outside. What? No. Okay, well, my people are FHA. You just wasted my time. You better be fixing this in the MLS then because now we're out because we can't buy it because they're not going to fix anything and FHA is going to require it. And I'm not putting that on my buyer. So we're going down to the next house. I think that that's what you're marking. When you say you'll accept FHA, you're saying I'm willing to fix that for your FHA appraisal, not in the inspection, but for the FHA appraisal. So my, this house in Aurora that I'm going to do, I'm not marking FHA and VA, which is sad because her dad was a, a veteran. It's sad to me, but they need all that they can get out of that house and not have to deal with painting or whatever FHA would require. Probably they'd want them to also paint the deck. But anyway, yeah, I you're not going to do it again. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I'm not doing that. I, you've heard that story. Yeah, I would even say like before even going under contract, like when showing a house to yes. a client, just yeah, pointing out all those little things. Yeah. That way they don't even have to get to the point of inspection and be yeah. like, oh, I don't want yep. this anymore. Exactly. But you have to do it in a way that's not alarming. Like I think Dahlia's saying, you know, like, um, okay, there's like, the, if these were carpeted over these little outlets, you'd feel it. You'd be walking along and be like, what, what is, what is this? Okay, y'all feel this. And then they walk over it and go, probably it's an outlet that got covered or a, in the basement, it's going to be one of those um, sump pump poles that has the cover and it's kind of squish because they need access. And if it's in the middle of the room, you're going to go, huh, your access means from the corner and all this has to be ripped, not ripped, but pulled up to gain access. So why is this in the middle of the floor? Why did they decide to do this? And so now you're asking more questions. And if they're okay with it, then when that comes up in inspection, they've already said they're okay with it. In your head, you're already going, yeah, yeah, we know. It's not a big deal because we're actually going to pull it up and put hardwood. So that's going to be a pillar maybe with access in it or something like that. Um, the cracks are a big thing. The cracks in the floors, in the basement, unfinished basement. In a finished, you can't see it. So you have no idea what's happening there. But you can kind of get a feel. Inspections don't generally go over the structural stuff, except for a little cracking. It'll say if it's a, something that they think that you should get more information about. Um, a roof, they do look up there, but just giving them, I tell my buyers, what we're looking for in an inspection is major items. I'm looking specifically for sewer. That's why, yes, you're gonna get a sewer scope because you don't want a $15,000 fix. And that is not going to be covered in the same way in your um, warranty. And I want you to have a good functional roof, something that's going to be able to function for several years plus. Mm -hmm. um, and then otherwise, we're not looking for peeling paint. We know that somebody dinged this wall. We can see this little hole right here. You know, I've got several places. I have an angry teenager and we've got several. Her wall is busted on both sides. And then where she, my door was locked and she kicked and missed the door and hit the side beside the door. I'm like, hey, she's gonna be angry for a while. So we're not fixing it, whatever. She's, she's gonna, gonna be angry for a while. She's gonna be angry for a while, probably till 18. <laughs> so I, you know, there's no point in us fixing it. It's just whatever, you start living with it. But okay, that's already there. Yep, that if, when that shows up on inspection, we already knew it and we were willing to offer on it anyway. Mm -hmm. So, um, the other things that radon, are you going to mitigate for radon? Or are you going to test for radon? Are you okay with not testing for radon? Have that conversation before in case they don't mind not testing or they don't plan on testing. The weird right. thing about the radon yeah. is like here they charge for the testing mm -hmm. in, uh, like we're, we came from Utah and like they did a radon test and the people left the flight were like, if you want to get tested, free tests on us, you know? So we're like, oh, great, free test. They're just like going to 
say that every house needs it. Yeah. yeah. But you know, they didn't. They said that ours didn't need it. So we oh, didn't do it, but yeah. Yeah, here most people test. Mm -hmm. Um and there's a fair amount of radon. It just depends on your I had one come up at 4.4 and EPA says under uh that it should be mitigated to under four. Well, 4.4, and they were like, Oh yeah, I saw I saw radon was high. And I was like, hi, 4.4. You're going to mitigate to get under 5.4 and at the same time here's the other side of it one day you want to be the listing agent on this house as they upgrade to another and they're going to have to pay for mit for mitigating it could be worse so i'd rather get that for my seller now the people that were the post-close occupancy agreement thing um he didn't mitigate because he tests right on at for his work so he's like eh, it's not a big thing i was like okay well, just so you know your buyer when you sell this house with another agent i'm kidding um <laughs> is uh it's probably gonna think it is a big deal and it also depends on like the family situation of the buyer when yeah. they have kids so i think isn't yeah. it mostly like most dangerous for kids because they're so young and they're still growing and stuff it's a long thing yeah. ricky had a client he was telling me about who worked with the epa and he was like, well, what did they come in at? And Ricky was thinking, oh my gosh, it's 24, which was a lot. It was in the 20s. And uh, he's like, his his client's like, ah, whatever, unless it's 50, I don't want to know about it. Wow. What? I feel like, I honestly feel like um, it's one of those things that they kind of created a marketplace for it so they can have business. Yeah. Yeah. It's literally I'm very skeptical forever. about the EPA. And, you know. Yeah. Okay, so now our homes are much more airtight than they used to be. So you're living in it, da da da. We mitigated our e our EPA, our um, radon when my husband went on nights and was sleeping in the basement. So it's primarily in the basement, and so now my my 13 year old is in the basement and it's mitigating from the other room. So now I wouldn't have put kids in the basement. Now if I'm not gonna finish my basement and have somebody uh, sleeping down there. Maybe I don't care. If it's a walkout, I got a lot more windows, ways of keeping the air moving and all that kind of stuff. I don't know. It, but I'm not going to advise my client that. Like, here's the research or here's the EPA web address. Research it. Figure out what you want to do. I'm, I'm here to support you. You're not telling them what. I don't tell them what I would do. Because then that could come back and go, well, Gwen said. Uh, Gwen said she right. wouldn't. But I'm not me, you know, I don't even go there. But I think it's a dangerous road. Did you have a question? No. So the um, the appraisal, we're also, we're, we're trying to eliminate the places that our, our contract could fall out, right? So in our offer now, we're saying, hey, we're gonna get um, an appraisal gap so that we already know what we're gonna do as the buyer and the seller then is going to need to come to the table with the rest of it. It's already written in the provision in the offer now. So back before this was all going like this, you just waited. Some people just waited. Some people just, you know, held their breath and hoped it appraises and, and deal with negotiation later. I tend to say what this, what the buyer is going to do when I'm representing the buyer. And then I will negotiate the rest of it and, and I'll leave out Damien Cox has that clause that says buyer will bring blah, blah, blah. Seller will come down. I leave that off because I just rather, I mean, that's what's going to happen because it's kind of out there. So it's up to you how you write that in your contract. But you're kind of, all these places that are areas that can fall out, you're just building little barriers around them saying, okay, if this, then this, right? Yes. You know, with, that's what your contract says. If this, then this. And when they sign it, they're saying, yep, I'll agree to that. If this, then this, right? Yep, I'll do that. You know, so that's really what your contract is. An agreement, what we're going to do at every single stage. It's the, the little wrenches that get thrown in there that make it kind of wonky and where it could still fall out, like title. Ricky had one that I get, I think it's closing or it did close Monday, um, where they had a lien. 
that showed up and they had refied since the lien. Well, the lien wasn't released. So really the lien was in first position and the mortgage that had been done was in second position. That lien's getting paid, but it wasn't in the net sheet and it wasn't in the old stuff. So somebody's really looking at a title claim because they didn't clear the whole title before they did the mortgage. But we don't have time for that. So he said he was gonna ask what they did, but the lender said, all right, we're closing on Monday. He's like, I don't know how, I don't know what they did, but we're closing on Monday. He thinks what they did was, because that lender was the same one who did the, the refi, they went back to that title company that did the refi. And when they pulled it, it was clear. And then, but they know it's still there. So that got them through. And now they have to go and clear that lien. It was just, it had been paid. It just hadn't been released, but it takes time. So what do you do in order to clear the title? And then it taking time. And the buyer got that. So they know that that's the thing. And they had to be completely transparent on the other side, make sure it's going to be a clear title. So yeah, it seems like whenever things come up with that, that take time, um, that's kind of when you go back to your client and talk about the motivation of why they want this house or why they want to move from this house or like that sort of thing. Well, the time part is over on the seller side. Mm -hmm. So yes, on the if your client is this, if you're on the listing side, you're saying, oh, this is not a big deal. This is going to, to be rectified, we just need to give them a little bit of time. And so maybe it's just a few days. That should not take 30 days. You mm -hmm. need a new buyer, you know? So yeah, but yes, if they're worried about it going through or whatever, you may need to revisit the motivation, absolutely. But on the buy side, they're pretty motivated because they're, that's why you want title in the first, it's in the first two weeks so that you can fix anything that you need to fix. You still got time. So Ricky was also okay. telling us about this thing that you could buy for five dollars on the, the address, showing like if there's any titles or like or any liens or anything owners and O and E and yeah. owners and encumbrance, and it's not something you can buy. It's something you, it's required for you to close your file. Oh, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you want to do that first. Um, I I bought two yesterday because I'm hopefully getting I'm getting one signed today and one. Um, Soon. I keep changing the dates. It was the first time I presented it to was in May. So um, hopefully she's signing. But I ordered her O and E too because we need to know that there's only just that one mortgage. But it doesn't show liens. It shows the main encumbrances, which are the mortgages and stuff. It's it'll be the, your lien stuff will be in the title. It's just not as as in depth. The O and E. I've never seen an O and E that had anything more than stuff that had been that was like a deed of trust that's just not very common is that my is that kids is mine like is that, i'm like oh, shh. um okay so uh what tasks have deadlines and are and what are those deadlines your you'll have your own so like are we talking about for the contracts well, that's what I think it's talking about. <laughs> the inspection. But well, yeah, but okay, we're talking so about all the these, loan? all of these areas. Like yes and yes. The dates and deadlines. Yep, all those dates and deadlines. Buyer agency. Oh no, I don't want to I want to put. Association docs. Yeah, and so which of those, I would say, which one of those are um, the ones that you have anything to do with? So your earnest money, I think that you're you're really hot on that. Make sure that gets in. So that's a, that's a really, all these dates are important. Then you have title and you're, you're sending this over. Gosh, I don't even, look at me, I'm gonna struggle. Uh, you're sending it to the lender, you're, you're under contract, and you're sending it to title. From what, there, what are you sending? You're sending your contract 
Oh, I'm sending it to the, my transaction coordinator, say, but I'm working through like, this. I'm going, yeah, hold on. Like, <laughs> you're sending it to the lender and you're sending it to the um, title company. And then title will start with their job, which is to order the title and all that kind of stuff. And they also owner do the owner's association if your listing agent is going to pay title to do that. Oh, how long is the page left? Uh, let's see, how many more pages do we have over here? Uh, probably half hour. Um, I'm just gonna, I just, well, who's, who's, who's on Zoom right now? Can you guys hear me? Zoomers. Brent, yeah, I'm here. Brent and Jimmy, is Troy on? I'm here, Jimmy. I didn't okay. see Troy. I haven't seen Troy. Oh, that's okay. I already know. I just need everybody that's here, except for Jamie. Will you guys all reach out and schedule a one on one with me? Because I need to get everybody back on the calendar for that. Did they hear me? Jimmy, yes. did you hear me? Yep. I I'll did. shoot you a text. Yeah. The microphones are amazing. Okay. Why? I know. I love Thank this. You guys. Good of it. That note to self during team meeting. I know, right? No yeah. more whispering no in the back. In the back of the, yeah. <laughs> I mean, as for other people who would, not me. <laughs> That's not something. Hard. Okay, so you got all the really all the dates that are here, but who does what is the association? You've got your seller's property disclosure. You should have had that already done with your from your listing before it actually hit the market. I like to put it in the um, the documents on the MLS, but you're going to send that over to the agent. You're communicating with the agent, or transaction coordinators communicating with the agent, the other agent, the co-op. Um, your new new loan application deadline. You're going to make sure that those things um, are done. I have not seen my transaction coordinator be all over that date because we're assuming the lender knows we got it under contract. He's on it. So that he can get his stuff going and i say he because that's all my lenders are dudes um and then these other dates that are for owner or owner carry appraisal mostly the lender but you're watching it you're not doing anything with it you're not ordering the appraisal the lender is well the sometimes you have to get on the lenders because not all lenders are good at like you know i don't security. use those lenders yeah, no, I'm just saying, like, because it's not like, you know, like, you refer them all the time. Sometimes when you get clients, they, they already come with the lender, oh, and it's yeah. like, what's going on? Like, yeah. <laughs> and when are we going to get the appraisal right. done? And right. so then you need to start communicating with them and see what's going on, because otherwise, the seller's like, on the seller's agent's like, so when is the appraisal going to be? Because mm -hmm. we haven't heard from the lender, mm -hmm. like, what? Like, but I'm just saying, sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. So... Yes. No, have, that's true. Yeah, like so Very it doesn't true. happen all the time, but in some cases you just happens. really have all these dates should have pushed to your phone. If you don't have that linked in to CTME, I would encourage you to do that. I have an Android, so I use Google uh, Calendar and all these dates squish into my phone. And then somewhere in CTME, there's a checklist and check, 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 check. And so I can go to my phone every day and go. Oh, these are already done. These are already done because Kim, my transaction coordinator, has already marked them off that they're already done. So that's something that when you're not using a transaction coordinator at first, make sure that you go to go to the CTME class and utilize that because that's gonna you're not gonna have to go. Wait, did I already do that? If if you have two multiple clients going on at the same time, did you already have you checked this box already? It's gonna be important to have that. Um, okay, so then the inspection, you, that's really you, even with a transaction coordinator, that's you to schedule it, that's you to help them go through it, that's you to set up your, your objection, and your, I tell my clients the objection is the things that you would like to have fixed, and you need to tell me what are deal breakers, so that if she starts saying, no, we're not going to be able to fix that sewer, I need to know so that I know how to communicate with her. Look, I'm already gonna tell you, this is a big deal. 
So is that you need to let your client know that this is a big deal. This could tank their deal. And we've gotten this far. Or what you've been on the market this long. You're impressing upon her why this is a good idea to fix the things that you've asked for. For me, and this might have been, I don't know who had your um, uh, the negotiation class, or if it might have been Ricky, um, that for me here, I put something on there that they can say no to, because through negotiation, people like to say no to something. They don't want to be yelling, like, yep, 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 we'll do it all. Sometimes they do. I've sent over an inspection before, and they're like, okay, well, they're almost done with, the re with everything that you listed. Yeah. You want to get me a resolution that says that you're doing all this? I'm like, I'm thinking that we're still, you know, negotiating. And they're like, oh, no, they already got it all done. What? Did they do it the way that I asked for it to be done? I mean, I would much rather have a resolution than they start working on it. But whatever. You can't control that. Your other due diligence documents, too. Um, right now, I don't see a whole ton of due diligence documents that people think that they are the book to the range or the microwave they put in three years ago. Uh, we don't care about that, but we do care about. So what's in my, in my contract to buy and sell is what I care about. So I'll put that in that paragraph um, where the due diligence is 10 point, 10, in the 10 areas to say what I'm looking for. So if you've done the shed, I want the blueprints for it. I want the permit for it. I want the permit for the basement remodel I want all of those kind of things. And that was probably in Donna's contracts class too. She didn't go over like permits and um, like blueprints and stuff like that. Uh, let me see what mine says. She said um, that one's only mostly if you're taking over like leases or you have tenants. So if you have like a solar or alarm lease or anything like that for tenants. So mine says, uh, and I can send you this paragraph. It says 10.6.1, in 10.6.1.2, where it says other documents and information, mm -hmm. this is what's in all of mine. 10.6.1, due diligence documents, regardless of whether any box is checked, and 10.6.1, the due diligence documents to be delivered by solo to buyer on or before the due diligence date, pursuant to blah, 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 copies of the following to the extent the following exists are in are in seller's possession or control. Utility bills, property tax statements relating to the property for the last 12 months, architectural drawings, blueprints as, as built contract plans or any other plan specifications regardless of and it goes on and on and on and on. on. That's really what you're looking for. You're not looking for the owner's manual for the fan that's in the bathroom. Nobody cares. So I, this might be in clauses, but why is this still like this? What is happening? This messed up my email when I tried to send you that thing again, Jamie. Oh, here. Now let's see if it's going to do it. Ha ah, ha ha. Why should I have so many emails over there? Okay, I've got it in the email. I'll type it in a bit. Okay, so then you have, huh? I got something for you. Oh, you did? Yay, finally. I just had to. Wow, 21 day closing? I know, right? It's fast. It's serious yeah. stuff. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so then you've got your ILC also done by title inspection. Okay, and then closing date and possession date. So then the possession part um, also will push to your my I can't sit like that. Um, you've got your possession date maybe off in the future because of post occupancy. So just watch that. And make sure that your listing agents not sleep at the wheel and know they're getting their people out. You know, hey, we're coming up on our post occupancy. How's your people doing? Blah, blah, blah. I still stay involved in tra transaction until post close occupancy is done. I think technically we're done at the close. Um, so, but it's not like the contract's going to fall through. 
Um, but I don't want to leave my client just if they, what if they don't get out? Yeah. You know, it's not going to be me, but I can certainly help guide them how, what attorney they might go to to evict their previous seller. I mean, it's not ever happened. Yeah, so. that actually it did happen to my aunt and uncle who just moved from here. They moved oh, back okay. to Oklahoma. And the guy who owned this house, he has a renter in there. And um, he, this guy did not want to leave at all. Yeah, the renter. Like, but sure him and his kids in a yeah. really bad position because mm -hmm. this guy didn't want to leave. But yeah, they had to do the whole like court thing. And oh no, just awful. That's too bad. So yeah. your uncle had to evict somebody else's tenant. Pretty much. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's sad. Yeah. Um. Okay. So how you, can you help manage other parties involved in the deal? I think that we kind of feel like we kind of went through that. Um, okay, so we kind of talked about this as we've been going. What your relationship with your the other side, the co-op, um, is really super important to make sure that you're communicating. You're letting them know that you know what you're looking at. You know what you're dealing. Uh, what dates are coming up, and what dates are on them, and what dates are not. Um, and then just keeping that relationship open. Um, and depending on what you're, if you're on the listing side, you're just checking in. Um, I, okay, so here's a scenario. You're on the listing side and you see on your phone that the objection is due on 123 Main Street, which you listed. It's due today. What are you going to do? Nothing. The, the what? I do nothing. That is not my job. I don't work for that, per that person. So if your objection is due. Oh. Okay. You're the listing agent. Yeah. Okay. I don't do that. I don't let them know. Um, I just let it go. And now my transaction coordinator will say, hey, I see that 123 Main Street has an objection that's due today. Have you seen anything? And it's usually later in the day when she asks me. Nope, I haven't seen anything. She's like, I'm assuming you want me to leave that go. Mm -hmm, I sure do. Because I'm assuming she's doing her job or he's doing their job. Mm -hmm. I'm just not my job to babysit them. It's not my client. So and I hope they don't forget because I don't want to put that out there for anybody. I wouldn't want that for the seller either or the buyer. So I just assume it's. Have you ever had anybody last minute, like say um, inspection, right? The uh, inspection deadline, like it's coming up. They're like about to miss it. It's like the day of, and then they're like asking um, later on in the day, they realize that they're not going to make that deadline. Can they extend it? Yeah. you ever have that have yeah. yeah you just do an amend it yeah. depends on what it's for mm -hmm. um most of the time i say yes because the, you want a good relationship you're going to come up you know we're we're going to work together at some point if, if we stay in business long enough we will work together we'll be opposite sides of, of the same transaction at some point um so we want a good relationship it's usually like oh my gosh we had the inspection done because we knew about that because our, our people got out, right? So we had the inspection done and now um, we're trying to get the sewer people out there, but they can't get there till tomorrow to give us a good bid, to give us a real good idea of what we're really looking at. We need another day. Okay, well, another day, but we're not gonna push the other dates. Is that good? Yeah. Okay, so then it changes that one date, doesn't change the resolution, and then it doesn't change the termination unless that's what you want to do but it's a every contract's different uh, they're the same but not different i mean they're the same and different is what i mean to say so but your your relationship with that co-op is very very important so um you want to make sure that you're communicating well and you're being respectful ethical you both want the same thing you've got a client who wants out and your other client they've got a client who wants in your client could be contingent on getting into their new place too. And they might have the same thing. You have these, you're here, but there's a lot more going on here. And if this agent, that's why um, when we were talking about, I think it was on that uh, ask a ALC member or anything, which is at 10 on Wednesdays, by the way. Um, it's really, really, really important to have that report even before you make an offer. And to be willing to be have a rapport made with if you're on the listing side. Don't be stoic and like, 
arm out because you, you it's everybody knows what kind of transaction the rest of it's going to be if that's the kind of demeanor you put on so it's really hard okay so ideally that's really the the last of it you get to the closing table and whee, and there's um I, I would encourage you to attend the closing that's not yours the first closing you go to should not be your own it could be but if you can shadow with somebody anybody who has a closing will let you go and now that we're closing in in doors again it's i would encourage you to do that so find somebody who's got a closing and go how do you um say you're on the listing side i mean i'm sure this will come up with um jc and all that but like how do you pick a, a title company like you know, um you, you, you usually it? have a rapport with uh somebody like a representative like kim thomason comes in here from land title um i met with someone from equity mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's just a ask around, you know. I use land title more often than I use anybody. My old brokerage was a boutique brokerage in Castle Rock and primarily used um, Heritage, which is upstairs. But her, she used to live in Littleton, so she had that one that was around um, Civic Green Park. So she used them. And I love them, but then she, my that rep stopped really talking to me a lot. And I was like... So I think it was a numbers thing. Maybe I wasn't putting up the numbers. I was new. Maybe I wasn't putting up the numbers. And I was like, eh, no. Kim's in here all the time. We have a great time together. You know, we're now personal friends. So, and you start building that rapport and then trying to get in. And then after you've got that rapport with the title company, it's a little bit more difficult. Yeah, because I don't want to try one. I know what these people will do. I know how they operate. I know they have... And once you get to know that, and like, unless you're a creature of, you know, shotgunning all your business out, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. I know people who use different ones. You're going to use, be on the buy side and use somebody that you, you like, and you may go with that. Guardian belongs to Caldwell Banker. That's their, I hope, I just like, please, Keller, please don't do a title company. I don't want to deal with that because then, you know, you're always having it. So, um, and then there's another one. I think there's three different ones that actually belong to, oh, who am I thinking about? HomeSmart. Is it Capital? Is it, they're, in, they're on Wilcox. You can see where the old clock, uh, you haven't been there that long though. Um, oh, I'm trying to picture that. So that we have, there's a home smart office in Castle Rock and they, they've got a title company and I've closed with them before. And it was like a sharp stick in the eye. And I was like, <laughs> no, not liking that. So really um, how, how then can you use to get repeat business and referrals? To, you can use the app, um, create your vendor list and utility list so that you can still provide them value after you close and then planning out your closing gift like we kind of talked about i think that that's a real personal this thing says uh what other place can you wow um i wrote down smart plans too yes yeah maybe you have a smart plan for, for um a somebody just purchased a house and you want to do a smart plan that goes through um maybe if you bought them a warranty your warranty is about to expire make sure you go through and have your furnace updated through your warranty before your warranty expires. You know, something like that. You could do a smart plan that, that says, don't forget to blow out your sprinklers because it's their first year in Colorado. Well, that might be for everybody to say, blow out your sprinklers. We do it here in October, mm -hmm. early October, because the snow is coming usually by Halloween. Right, you know, forget that princess dress. That's not going to happen unless you've got a coat on. Your princess down here and a winter skier up here. It's just the way it is, you know. And when you people who want to plant a um, a garden mm -hmm. in April, like they used to do in Alabama, no, don't do that. And it's all going to be dead. Definitely don't start your sprinklers too soon, too. Yeah, exactly. Same thing. I think it's after hand water until after. Mother's we got Day, a thing from sure. our water company. 
that talks about, about it. And then it, it, it tells us what days specifically we can water on. Oh, yeah, yeah. So then yeah. we just set ours up to right. the United States. But, and after, you know, people want to get their stuff going and you can sprinkle in Castle Rock, you can do it outside of those days in certain ways before and after they that calendar exists. But it's, um, yeah, people don't know. So, but that's a good idea. Doing the smart plans and doing um, the gift giving up like reminders. Yep, doing the reminders. Maybe you set them up in your farm. Maybe you're, they're going to be on a plan that's going to be more task oriented toward you, not to send out. But maybe it's on a quarterly pop by. Maybe you're going to bring in that pop by thing because you're just now you're not looking for them to. Have you seen that curve? There's like this whole thing about a curve about when people buy, they the probability of buying. And then they bought here and the probability of buying then is going down, down, down. And then they hit a bottom for them. And then the probability of buying is starting to come up. Well, where have you been talking to them this whole entire time? And because if you if their probability of buying again, selling and buying has been going up, but you haven't been talking to them, somebody else has, and now they're going to catch them the next time. So yeah, that that's a... That's a really big thing. And or anniversary cards when they're, I can't believe you've been there a year. How's this, how's this possible? You know, how's it been going? Hopefully this is the first time you've been talking to them. But that's a big one too, is anniversary dates, birthdays. Those are all different touches that you can keep on because they are on a cycle to buy and sell again. They just don't know it. And neither do you, but you want to be the one talking to them if you want the repeat business. Yeah. And I think I saw it's either Realist or Art Colorado. I mean, it's all there, but mm -hmm. um, you can actually like they have like a nice little chart or graphic that shows how likely they are to buy it's or how, how likely they are to sell again. Remind. Oh, it's a remind. Yeah, remind is really cool. If you go to to YouTube and look up remind, R E M I N E. Mm -hmm. Um, it's about mining. If you think about it, it's not like remind, like, oh, I forgot that. It's uh, about mining and it will show you, you could drop a pen and show, see who in the area has been doing activities, looking online. It's kind of creepy. <laughs> doing activities that see like people keep calling me. Yeah. Do you want to list your house? Yeah. Sure. Yes, because you're probably looking online at houses, <laughs> right? Yeah, but why do they have your phone number? <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Because it's probably a cell phone. Yeah. And you put it on something. Yeah. That got sold and da 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 da. Zillow. Zillow sells. So, yeah, all of that tells you the probability of people. And my probability is always in the medium high to high because, and they obviously don't know. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. So, but it's pretty funny. And you can, when you're doing that uh, farming, you yeah. can look for those people specifically and hop on those. Okay. Faster than you hop on the ones that are low. And then so I eliminate, I guess. yeah, prioritize those. And then I eliminate those people who just moved. But that, and I do that just to get started because once you, those people know somebody. Because mm -hmm. if you heard of the reticular activating system, it's in the back of your brain. It's like literally a place in your brain that if, you're in the market for a car. Like, I like this white one. I never see the white one. I really want this white Jag. Well, as soon as you buy it, you see a white Jag everywhere because they've always been there, but now your reticular, reticular activating system is, is now more heightened to see the white one. So if they were in the market, they now know five or six or seven or eight people in their sphere of influence that was also looking to buy. Well, you want those referrals. Mm -hmm. So they're, they have a heightened RAS to, to know who's buying and selling. Brittany had a great a great one for that. I wrote down my aha sheet, but the, um, to throw your buyers a housewarming party yes. to invite their friends and family, whatever yeah. they want. Yeah. That, Cause then now you're like the star guest because you do this. And it could be so simple, like get from cookies and drinks. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you can get that sponsored because guess who else is there? people lenders. who have mortgages yeah you so have, you could have your lender come with you they're the lender that they use oh and to say hey do you want to throw this together 
let's, you know, and you're, and then what I did, I had one in Denver and me and the lender walked the streets and we invited oh, super sketch where they, <laughs> where they live was like a pocket of a, of a sliver of a section that was revitalizing. This was just south of Spear on Galapago. One block over was like, Knock, 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 and the door goes boom. Ah, I broke your door. You know, it's just like didn't actually happen that way. But it was all it, everything was. I was so glad that was with her. And I'm still kind of like scared of Denver. It's like I feel like Denver is yeah. just its own animal. I'm yeah. like, I'll stay over here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I stay down here for a reason too. Yeah, I'm trying I'm, to stay south of where seventies. Yeah, kind of, and then Castle Rock. And I'll help. I'll help anywhere, but I'm not door knocking up there. I'll help buy or sell anywhere, but I don't door knock in those areas, but we did door knock to invite to a party and then COVID. So we never got to throw the party. Oh. So that was unfortunate. Now it's been a couple of years, but that's a terrific idea. And I've never gotten right back to it. But you could do that as a going away for the, for the seller too. Mm. Um, and oh, you know, so standard. Um, if they're moving out of state. Yeah, you could do it if they're moving out of state too, or, or local. Because you hopefully you help them buy. Right, right. You're right. Only one, said. only one part. Um, I have done a uh, for the my sellers. I've done a house cleaning because I have a whole house cleaner. I will do it for like two fifty. Yeah, she's funny. She goes, the house was really dirty. Are you sure? It was like three hundred dollars. I'm like, it's fine. The warranty over here costs five hundred. I'm gonna pay you all the way up to you know five something and I haven't had anything that that was that bad and that's a huge blessing when they're trying to get the trucks packed and leave that the next day you can have the cleaners come in so you could make that your standard but that's these are also they feel so they're super helpful and they're so grateful but it doesn't last there's nothing with your name on it that's gonna do a repeat but those are great for out-of-state buyers they're you're not gonna see them again you know our sellers out-of-state sellers I feel like uh, having the house clean after they're, they moved out is more for the buyer. It can be, but they're, they, it's if it's they like put it in, still too, right? they have to do it broom clean is what legally is broom clean. Um, and it depends on what I used to put it in my inspection objection that it had to be broom clean or had to be professional clean. It depends. But some people right now are thinking it's, it's a mandatory thing to be professionally cleaned because of COVID. Mm. And I'm like, no and so then they make assumptions and all that kind of stuff and it causes problems so i have done that because i think it's just it can take it off my my seller's plate because they think they have to do it um okay so you can do your checklist in opportunities and command under here it says select under contract and then you edit your stages I'd like to tell you that this is really, really, really cool. Really is. And somebody should set this up for me. I should write that down because I have an assistant. And then I should learn how to use it. Um, it's all in my head. And I don't have, I have the TC that does the other piece. So I just leave this in my head. You know, it. If you can set it up and use it from, from the get-go, I think you're way better off than trying to learn. This came on board when I got here and I'm learning what GCI means. You know, I mean, like, do, don't you think there's a thousand acronyms in Keller Williams? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you don't, you haven't been here but a hot minute. It's, I mean, it's crazy. I remember my first bold, I had a whole sheet in the back of the book that was just a bunch of acronyms I had to look up later. So I don't even know what that you just said because I had to write down an acronym. I don't even know what you're talking about but they assumed that people at Bold had been there more than two hours because that's what it was for me. Um, so this is a really cool thing. And like I said, that I will eventually one day maybe get to this and use it. But this buyer guide and seller guide also is in command and really useful. This is where Amy comes in. She, she knows what these are for. She knows how to manipulate them. She knows how the how to tactically build it, and then how to use, utilize it. Building, I could walk through building. We've kind of done this kind of stuff before, 
um, in class? I bet mine's built generically. I mean, it's in there in your back yeah. office or in your command back here already ready for you. You just need to tweak it the way so it matches you. I've got it built like here, but I've never sent it out to anybody because it was new. And I was learning so many other new things that were more important, I felt like anyway. So, ta da. All right. So, ooh, this is our almost the last slide. Okay. So, um, do you guys have any questions? I feel like I'm rushing through. And at the same time, it's this class feels like a, a recap. Follow your thing, your contract, <coughs> what you agreed to, be ethical, don't miss any deadlines. Note to self, don't teach this class again. <laughs> it's the only one I had left. The only one I could. What was it? I mean, there's because there's it's not flashy. I like the flashy. <laughs> get more fun stuff. Once you get to a certain place in your contract, you're just waiting for your closing. And that's when you're like, I feel like I should be doing something. So what is that? Do you prefer being on like the, the buyer side or the seller side when it comes to like dealing with the, the contract to close? All day, every day, I'd rather be listing. Okay. Yeah. Just less responsibilities and time commitment that goes into that? The time commitment. You can have, you could have, I have had four listings at one time. Um, I was at a ceiling of two and then I realized, wait a minute, I only have three signs. Remember that subconscious stuff? I only had two signs. I, would, I couldn't lead Jen for listings because what if I needed another sign? I was like, this is stupid. And once I realized it, I went and got five signs. Well, now I just told you the max I've ever had is four at one time. And it's still crazy, but if I had by or four buyers all in a contract all in oh jamie I, it would just be a lot more things going on more um possibilities of losing a date or something like that okay so i and and what if you had four who all wanted to go out looking at houses in the same weekend well, i could have four huh I'd be like, okay, family, I'm renting a hotel because I got four listings all going live the same weekend. I wouldn't recommend it, but I'd be, you're not going to see me. I'm talking to agents. I'm, this is all you do. But at the end of that, now they're all tracking the same. Where if you were on the buy side, now that all the inspections have to be done about the same week, all the, everything's hitting at the same time. So yeah. Your listing, there's we you know, saw there are six different mm -hmm. major items on the um, buyer thing, and there's only four on the listing. Yeah, I'd much rather have listings. But wouldn't your four listings, um, you know, I mean, hypothetically, be also buying? Possibly. You know, so like I tend to showing and doing all yeah, the stuff all, all on the other side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. I tend to have. I've got one that my two that one is in Aurora and her mom's they put her in a Alzheimer home. So it's not her house and it's her house, but Alzheimer, she's using all the money to go into the apartment. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the other one is moving to Dallas, mm -hmm. but I have it's a referral. referral. I got them that agent. He's like, those the friends of mine. He's like, Gwen, how long have you known this Andrea? And I go, well, why do you ask? And he's like, oh my God, it was like talking to you. And I was like, that's funny. I was like, I'm going to tell you straight. I said, as soon as I know you're going to Dallas, I'm calling five, 10, however many people I had to call until I knew that I, I had met a rock star. And I said, when I talked to her, I talked to three people. Somebody's not calling me back. They called me back a week later. He's like, can I help your friends? I said, no. This, how you do anything is how you do everything. So it is super important to make sure that the way that you present yourself to another agent is the way that you would present yourself to that client. And it needs to be par, you know, it absolutely has to be. So when I met her, I was like, oh my gosh, I love her. So it was pretty funny. It's like, yeah, uh, I talked to her like 20 minutes before I sent her your phone number. It's like, what? 
Yeah, but she's done like $10 million already this year. And he was like, oh, okay. In Dallas, which is, and where she is, it's a lot of force. So it wasn't like she's doing a, yeah, a bunch of 200s or something. And it's her and her husband. So, which is great for my friend and her husband because the way that you talk to each of them is completely different. He's like real black and white. She's more flowery, more artsy. So what about you guys on uh, on Zoom? Do you have any questions? Any aha? Uh -huh. Do you say nope? Silence. No, I'm good. I'd... <laughs> You've been working this whole time. You're like, I'm not even paying attention. <laughs> no, I'm listening. I'm listening. Awesome. All right. Well, of course, if you, I'm sending out this uh, 10.6.1.2, whatever that was, about the due diligence stocks, what I use in that on the contract to buy and sell. So I'll send that to you. And um, if you've got anything else that I'm missing to send to you, let me know. Appreciate that. I kind of do have, I guess, somewhat of a question. Yeah. Um, I keep getting emails from like different uh, like companies who do like marketing or just like tips and stuff like that. How do you usually, you know, handle that or do you just kind of ignore it or? I handle it with the delete button. Okay. Because um. <laughs> one of the big ones that keeps like emailing me is like Authorify. I don't know if you've heard of them. But... Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, with yeah. the book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like them. I like what I like the concept of what yeah, they I do. Think it sounds good. I think it sounds great. However, not in the beginning. Yeah, and I was gonna say like it doesn't sound like it's worth the money. Like it's expensive. It is expensive, and you've got. I mean, you. And I feel like I have I all these resources slow. already for free with. Yes. Here. Yeah. So. A lot of those resources for free here. But yeah, I, I do kind of like their general idea of like going about like this goes and expires and other niches just because yeah, I'm not there's not the biggest fan of like just straight up cold calling. <laughs> yeah, like the follow up. Right. So right. And that's what I think that you have to look at. Um were you in team meeting yesterday? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I was. So the the seven layers levels of communication, mm -hmm. that book is so amazing it's so amazing it, it's so easy to read it's kind of like a it's written like a story okay. sort of like the millionaire morning if you've read that it's sort of like that kind of story um like an allegory mm -hmm. um so it's it's a super easy read and what i like about it is um he walks you through the different levels what how communicating with somebody is different like a door knock, what's that feel like? Because you're eyeball to eyeball, how it's different. And then how it is if you just get something in the mail mm -hmm. or if it's on the, the basket at King Super, you know, or if it's on a park bench and how that is different. Um, so really you've got what you need in command. And then if you wanna send out something and then follow it up with door knocking in a farm, and then doing pop buys. Buffini has some really great information that's free on his podcast. He also has a bunch of stuff on YouTube and he is a very, he's really cool to listen to too, because he's Irish. Um, What's his name? Buffini, Brian Buffini, Buffini B-U-F-F-I-N-I. -I. Um, and he's got, he's got some books. He's got, uh, he's, you can get so much for free yeah. that just because right now, especially right now, you don't know how how you're going to end up marketing or how you're going to end up getting your your information out who are you marketing to but like always 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 your sphere is going to be your first and best source of deals of transactions initially and then from there what is that looking like for you um mine is was sphere and then referrals from that sphere so then when my coach says, are you calling people? And I was like, uh, well, I kind of haven't really, um, no, is the real, why? 
this is where all your business comes from. And then I have to explore with myself, why am I not calling? You know, this is where your business is coming from. And I often use my kids as an excuse, the summer as an excuse, all of this. My summer drops off every single year. Why is that happening? I choose for it to happen. That's how. If you have no business and you've been doing the activities, where, where's the choice in what you're doing? Mm -hmm. And why are you still doing it if it's not effective? If you've done it 90 days and it's not. And so some of those things, it's like, can I do this for 90 days and peace out? and have only put in a little bit of time, then maybe you could try it. If you can't, I don't know that it's worth doing that. Don't you do a year commitment when it might not have been beneficial. Right. Yeah, you wanna be able to get out of it if you can. Thanks for calling. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so I've got Heather. Up here and do. Yeah, right now I'm trying to like build a sphere down here because I mean most people I know is from Oklahoma and then of course UNC so northern Colorado and then like that doesn't really help me a whole lot. <laughs> so I'm like I am trying to at least get referrals from those people, but it's like my sphere is not very helpful. So I'm trying to build my sphere bigger by like joining community things down here. So what I think was on the slide before this one. Where were you seeing them again? Yeah. I live in Parker. Parker but I did, I mean, I lived in Greeley for three years because UNC. And so like most everybody I know is up there. <laughs> so one uh one thing that uh, JC was telling us that we could do for like order we need to like, you know, network a little bit more is, um, in Castle Rock, they have like the planning committee and all that stuff. So you pulled up like the city page and like what all was coming to Castle Rock, all those things. But then it showed that there was like probably 10 or 12 openings if you wanted to go. And then like whenever people submit stuff and you vote on it and you go to the meetings and talk about it or whatever. And that's a good way to network because then when people, you know, like say, hey, then you like, I don't know, maybe yeah. just. Network. Yeah, I did find a good like volunteer website too. So um, there's actually something that I signed up for for three weekends um, in Castle Rock. It's just like reading children's books to mm -hmm. kids in the park. And of course, you know, parents are going to be there. And so yeah. I like, I'm going to try and do that. Um, there's, there's actually multiple different um, horse branches where you can volunteer for that with like therapy horses and guiding them. And I'm thinking of doing that too. I just need to get some boots. <laughs> okay, so think about what, how are you going to get their information? Yeah, that's what I'm still kind of like trying to figure out. And yes. I mean, I guess just straight up going up to the people and just talking to them and just, you know, asking to do the Ford mm -hmm. and then naturally come up with, yeah, I guess that's what I'm doing here. Do you have your name tag yet? I do have my name tag. Yeah, where's that? That's kind of, um, yeah, like with the kids thing. You could be like, oh, my name is, you know, Heather, it's right here on my name tag. Point it out, and then they say if the parents are there, then they see, oh, Kelly Williams, you know. Mm -hmm. So then they might mm -hmm. have some sort of, yeah, on you know that uh, subconscious. Yeah. yeah. And I got a bunch of business cards that probably came in the mail yesterday that actually have like my picture on them. Yeah, that's good. So, Crystal, can I get your um, email? Um, Crystal dot green. Is it C R Y S T A L? Okay. Dot green. green. Dot green. Green, just like the color. I came K W. Uh -huh. Oh, I was like, who's Nicole? <laughs> That's me. <laughs> and Jamie and Brent and Jimmy. Okay. Yeah, it's funny when I made my email. It was like freshman year of high school, and that's when I still thought like you didn't usually like put your name, like your actual name, and things <laughs> like that, so people can't like. Yeah. Career, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I was just coming out of grade. So when I was, you know, I was I was like in sixth grade and I still have it. Yeah. Oh, seriously? I, yeah. When I was in sixth grade, my skier cat won. <laughs> oh, I, that, I, like, now okay. I'm going to stop sharing now. Okay. <laughs> do you, if, and if you need anything, Brent, holler at us. Okay. Yeah. I've been liking, I'm going to do another open house. Uh, I definitely will. Thank you. Um, All right. See you later. Hopefully, a.